to my immediate uh, left, uh, Alan Balutis is a distinguished fellow and senior director of North American Public Sector for Cisco Systems Business Solutions Group, which is the firm's global strategy and consulting arm. Prior to that, he was president and C C CEO of Government Strategies, which was a leading market of the re leading market research firm Input. Uh, from 2001 to 2003, he headed the in Industry Advisory Council. He was a founding member of the Federal CIO Council and spent 20 year, 28 years in the federal government, including uh, being the first the CIO of the Department of Commerce. Uh, and he's also a six-time Federal Computer Week Fed 100 winner. Uh, Doug Bourgeois uh, is the Vice President and Chief Cloud Executive Public Sector for VMware. Uh, prior to that, uh, he was the Director of National Business Center at the Department of Interior, where he led 1,800 plus workers to provide business management services government-wide, like uh, ones we talked about earlier, IT, payroll, HR, and the like. Before Interior, he was the CIO of the Patent and Trademark Office, and from 94 to 2001, he held several roles at, at FedEx. He's also a host of VMware's Federal IT Challenge, which airs on WFP in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Mark Foreman, we've heard Mark's name mentioned a couple of times here as really the first uh, official CIO uh, as established in the EGOV Act. Mark is president and co-founder of Government Transaction Services, Inc., which he established in 2010 to be the leading provider of cloud-based business process and transaction services uh, aimed at simplifying interactions with federal government. He, as I mentioned, was also the first administrator for EGOV. Uh, he also developed government transactions services products that reduce administrative burdens, um, including easy grant filing, which provides electronic filing for post-award reports. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, David Milicek leads Google's U.S. government cloud computing business. Since joining Google in 2007, and he's helped to rapidly establish and expand Google's cloud computing footprint in the public sector. Uh, he also led Google's efforts uh, to accredit Google Apps under FISMA and was part of the team that launched Google Apps for Government in 2010. In 2011, Federal Computer Week named David to a list of top 100 leaders. And prior to joining Google, David was a senior manager uh, with Accenture's federal strategy practice. So uh, I'm going to start um, with Mark. Um, Mark, you've had the, the luxury of both being inside uh, at the top levels thinking about this and implementing it, and, and we've heard about Quicksilver and a number of other the initiatives that you put in place. Where do you see the next 10 years? If we were to do this in 10 years and we would say, here are the accomplishments we've made. This is what we've done. Tell us two or three things you would like to see different in 10 years. Not, not so much as a criticism of where we've been, but just technology changes and all these new opportunities. That, organizations get to take advantage of? Well, I think we're at the cusp of a new productivity model for government. I, I was very uh, excited to hear about the discussion on the last panel on, on productivity. And I think really there are four key elements that I envision around this model. Uh, first of all, the recognition by government that information is abundant, it's open, and uh, it's largely non-proprietary. Uh, I uh, had an article on Federal Computer Week a few weeks ago that uh, some of you may have seen, but uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by initiatives like the Billion Prices pro Project at MIT. You know, we're at a cut point now where it's not clear what is the role of government in collecting and disseminating information. There's this assumption that all this information we've collected by government is the right information, but it's not. You know, you think about the, the discussion over the unemployment rate and other things. Building Prices Project, basically, a couple guys with a, a cluster of servers, you know, maybe cost them ten or $15,000, captures real-time data from the Internet on prices. Now, think about this. You know, the way we do the inflation numbers, people get sent out to collect a basket of goods, and then they come back, and three months later that data gets in, and, and three months after that, we see what the inflation really was for six months ago. And you compare that to the Billion Prices Project, where they're calculating inflation and price differentials around the world instantaneously, because that data is all on the internet. I use uh, Safeways. Uh, what, is, what do they call it? You shop or you save or something like that. Those prices are on the internet, you know. And, and so you, you kind of wonder, well, if the government's collecting it, why are we still paper-based? And 
And even so, why, why is the government collecting this? I'm, I can get that real-time information. So I think we're at the cusp, and people understand that, and that's what real consumerization of IT is about, is government had to do it before because the transaction cost of us getting it was too high. That's gone. So I anticipate this, this uh, information abundancy really change in government's role in information collection. The second thing is commoditization and shared services. Now, what we tend to think of commoditization like Windows, Google Apps, and, and so forth. But the real issue here is uh, IT has rapidly become a service. And the services are commoditized. They're, they tend to be transactional. Uh, government hasn't quite figured this out yet, but it will over the next 10 years, I believe. And, uh, and via that, we'll understand what is the service that government is supposed to provide. And uh, how much of that service is a utility, essentially, that can be highly automated, and how much of it's knowledge-based. And what is government's catalog of services, if you will. The third thing is that the efficiency gains have to come from distributed input. Uh, the productivity of the government employee operating in a silo is a model of the 20th century, not the 21st century. And in the 21st century, the model has to be real-time assembly of the people that have the insights. Uh, and I believe that the one metric, you know, we use this going back to Quicksilver, but I, I believe it goes back probably years before we talked about it, response time for government. How fast does it take for government to make a decision? And what are the opportunities to accelerate that? And, and I think we'll see big productivity gains in that. And then the final thing is, uh, the performance breakthroughs are driven by group insights. You know, it's no longer just competition by agencies. And it may not even be government that has the insights. But we've got to find a way to get to a performance breakthrough paradigm. And I think that comes from the community and not from the bureaucracy. That's great. You know, a few years ago I was talking to the Dutch government and their, their data maven and, and one of the things that they did, they, they were embracing this model. One of the things, they actually used to go out and survey swine farmers to how many pigs did you have and how many pigs were you putting up for uh, slaughter. They don't do that anymore because there's an online swine portal that tells you every day how many swine have been sold and killed and they just tap into that database and done the whole thing. So I think you, all of those points were great, but that one in particular I thought, I thought was really interesting. Alan, how do we move more into this vision? Mark talked about a lot of things, but one of them was a much more fluid, data-driven, both on the input and the output side model, which is still hard for government. Yeah, it, it is, and uh, I think uh, just a couple of comments on your first panel a very had a very nice feel good aspect to it, but I, you know, I I'm I'm really disappointed in the sense that after all these years, we still focus on this issue of e-government. You know, I, I don't hear anybody talk about e-business these days. Everybody just assumes that's the way you do business. You do business online. You do your bank account online. You do your shopping online. You do your credit card. But in, in government, we're still wedded to these old ways of doing business. And, and I think, you know, Mark mentioned a, a couple of key drivers. I, I think there are some uh, other things I've put on the table. One is that I really have come uh, slowly but steadily toward embracing the fiscal cliff uh, because I think it will actually drive government toward thinking in transformative ways. Uh, which really uh, needs to be done. You know, we've, we've gotten, we've rung about all the efficiency and effectiveness out of uh, government, but I, I think by uh, uh, kind of like Ben Hur school of, uh, of, of, um, of, of management. But now we really need to think in transformative kinds of ways. Um, and, and I think we need to recognize too that that's not going to come from or be driven from the federal level. Citizens have more of their interactions with local government than they do with state government. They have more interactions with their state government than they do with the federal government. The ways in which they interact with the federal government are extremely limited. Um, and so I, I think we need to turn some of these things uh, uh, 
around it and focus more on high value applications. I think the Quicksilver Task Force did a wonderful job, but what we lacked was the what are citizens, what, what do citizens want? Where would they first stop to have uh, uh, applications made available to them? Uh, we, I, I think it is positive in the sense that citizens, to the extent they're satisfied with government at all, they're more satisfied with their e-government experiences than they are with traditional government service delivery. So th there are some things we could uh, build on. I think Karen in the first panel did mention that I think Mark picked up on this as well, that the trust is one of the most critical issues in terms of our, uh, of our next steps. Yeah, it seems that one of the things citizens want, speaking as one citizen, uh, is speed. Um, I ordered something the other day online. It was there in my house in two days. Compare that to the experience I had last year with a federal agency where I was required to fax them a form. Okay, uh, so I fax in the form, eight weeks go by, the deadline is missed, I completely missed my opportunity to do what I wanted to do, and the government missed out on their opportunity, nothing in response. So the fact that we can get the private sector to do something in two days, and the federal government takes eight weeks, if not more, we see that over and over again. But you know, one thing that, that um, Mark did not mention, although I think it was alluded to, Doug, is uh, I would imagine that in 10 years, uh, we're going to just be, we won't even be talking about the cloud because the, it'll, it won't, like we won't even be talking about E, it'll just be the cloud. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how you see that evolving in the government? Well, I think uh, everyone in this room would probably agree that they don't want to talk about the cloud now anymore. <laughs> um, as hyped up okay. and over as our term as, as that is. Um, <laughs> And, and I think it, it, it actually is an Im, Im, important note because when, um, you know, there's a, a couple of things I took away from my seven and a half years at, at FedEx that were very, very important that, that led to other successes in, in my career. And one of them was um, that in order to drive innovation within a large organization, the culture has to understand that it's really not about the IT at all. And this is kind of getting to the point that, that Alan just made, which is, it's really not about you know, as much the electronic part of it as it is the business or the mission part of it. And so to, to try and tie that point back to a point Mark made earlier, which is really in order you know, for, for this um, productivity gain to occur at the wide scale that we're talking about across, across government, the innovation really needs to be focused towards the, the results that matter, is what I used to say when I was a CIO, and in that sense, there, there is some really good stuff that came out of the federal enterprise architecture effort. One of the things that I found useful when I was a CIO practicing at that time was the input outputs outcomes measure framework, which was essentially breaking it down to say, look, you've got to keep track of the resources that go in, the inputs to what you're doing. You've got to keep track of the results, the outcomes, the things that you produce with that from an efficiency standpoint, like unit costs and things like that. But when the day's done, it's really about the outcomes that the mission really needs. And having a, a small line of sight, simple line of sight to a few key measures within that area can keep the overall effort focused on the end result, which is what is the business or the mission going to gain from all of this, this stuff. Uh, another is um, the fundamental shift. Because of all these things, because of the way infrastructure is now being commoditized to a level that it, it really hasn't been before, um, it's, it's really getting caught up and being too much focused on the infrastructure when it's really about a complete transformation of the role of IT in general in the enterprise. And um, I see, because I, I work with CIOs day in and day out and, and helping them come to terms with what strategy can be relative to this thing called cloud computing, which is simply a mechanism. Nothing more, nothing less than that. Which is the role of IT is now becoming that of a true service provider. But most IT organizations were not structured and are not cultured and are not staffed and are not led in a way that is, is conducive to delivery um, as a service. And so the fundamental you know, transformation that needs to occur while it's happening now at the technological level with cloud computing needs to go way, way, way beyond that to the organizations that are, are leveraging technology for the good of the overall mission itself. So in other words, we move from a role of Sort of making sure the boxes work uh, to making sure that the services work. And that those are exactly that. It's no longer about the box. In fact, the box is irrelevant in the, in the scheme anymore. 
um, that it's really about the services that the business needs to carry out what the citizens want and what the citizens need, and not about the processes from an IT perspective about how quickly we can get the server implemented, because it's not really as relevant anymore. David, do you want to build on this? And so, you know, a lot of what the business model that you're engaged in and trying to help government think through and, and, and act. Do you want to share some thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with so much that has been uh, has been said. I mean, fundamentally, over this 10-year period, we've seen uh, enterprise technology turned on its head, where uh, where once it, it was a small group of people in a room that was making decisions about the kind of technology that would be used at federal agencies and that citizens would use to interact with uh, with the federal government. And and now we're seeing that has been completely turned on its end and consumers are driving the technology, right? It, it, that, that's what we witnessed in, in, in the last 10 years and probably it would have been fairly hard to predict uh, that um, the consumer devices, the consumer technology used by the citizenry, by the federal workforce would be so influential over the technology decisions made and, and really the overall uh, technology agenda for, for government. I, I think that's the, uh, the major trend, the major development that we look at over the past 10 years, and I think it's the major trend and development that we look at for how, how we'll shape the, the next 10, 10 years uh, moving forward. Federal workers uh, and, uh, and, and citizens, they, they want to they want to work the way that they're living. They, they, they want to have the same technology at work that they have at home because it works, because they understand it. It's, um, you know, we, we, we talk about this all the time, but there are federal employees that, that go to work still today and they have an easier time managing their kid's soccer game, their daughter's wedding, their, uh, you know, wh whatever it is, their, uh, their poker club. And they have a much easier time doing that than they do collaborating at work, and that's not the way that it should be. And we're seeing that uh, go away. We are seeing now federal agencies adopting what, 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 what when we talked about this in, in 2002, and we said consumer-grade technology, that, that would have made people very uncomfortable. But, but now consumer-grade consumer technology has actually outstripped what's available in, uh, in, in the enterprise world in, in terms of its performance and, and, and capabilities. So we do see federal agencies uh, adopting uh, cloud computing and these consumer technologies and, and employees getting uh, more powerful technology at a lower cost and are able to, to do the things that they uh, that can do at home. And I think over the next 10 years, we, we will see more of that. Um, you know, when I, when I think about the, the next 10, 10 years as well, I, I, one of the things I, in, in, in looking back, even over the period since, since I joined Google in, uh, in 2007, that I, th I think we can expect that, um, you know, that, that 10 years from now, uh, whatever people are, are, are most vociferously complaining about or, or warning us about today is probably what will be adopted 10, 10 years from now. Uh, because when, when, we, when we think about um, all of the, uh, in, in, in 2007, when I, when I told people I was joining Google, uh, I was told I had made a terrible decision. That it, what, what I was going to be doing, I was going to be working on cloud computing within the federal government, public sector. And people stood back and said, do you realize what you've done? Because this was this is never going to happen. The government cannot adopt cloud computing. There are these security regulations, and the government just will not uh, do this. It is uh, impossible. It will never happen. Procurement, this, this, that. And, um, and, and it has happened, and, and it has happened across state governments and, and and, and federal governments. I think the mark of success in 10 years will be how far have we either uh, diminished or eliminated the gap between when the private sector is adopting technology and the government is adopting technology. I think that, that really plugs into uh, what my fellow panelists have, have talked about as well. So, so a few year, years ago, I, I remember that there was a federal agency, I can't remember which one, uh, they, they put out a tender uh, to create uh, for a contractor to build them very expensive system that, that would allow them to host chats and, and, and post things. And I thought, that Facebook and LinkedIn? And uh, don't, those are free. And so I guess, how, how uh, 
I don't know who wants to jump in on this, but you know, part of what it seems to me the challenge is, is can we take a lot of these great free applications in the private sector and, and use them in government? Uh, maybe in some cases we can't. You know, maybe the CIA needs something a little bit more uh, higher grade. But uh, you know, how can is that is that part of the vision in the next ten years? Pardon? Yeah. Well, uh, let me say uh, a, a key part of understanding this puzzle. I fear that the IT community, the government IT community, has basically become the insulators of the bureaucracy rather than the uh, catalyst for transforming the bureaucracy. And that that's part of the issue here. You know, maybe as a community we, we just are so out of sync with the things that, that David is raising, that you're raising with the, today's business or social media uh, techniques. You know, I think about Intellipedia and derivatives thereafter. You know, where did they hit the wall when the supervisors had to surrender <coughs> their legacy paperwork approval processes? You know, so they had great content. Just to be clear, Intellipedia is like the Wikipedia uh, for the intelligence community and government. Created by a couple guys, again, a server in a closet, very low cost, you know, at the same time, Congress had pursued the, the information sharing environment, gave it a budget of $50 million. These guys were doing it with a, with a couple servers, a couple guys in a closet, costing the government less than 150 k a year, as I, I recall. So, uh, so they hit the wall at the supervisory level. And yet this large project that was given to the, the IT uh, community became <coughs> the large project. It fell right into COPS paradox, and, and many of you uh, may know that COPS paradox is this, this uh, guy from the Canadian Treasury who, to get his certificate from one of these uh, IT project manager training courses, had to write a paper. Papers generally called COPS paradox now, but he said, look, we've known for 20 years how to deal with the problems in IT projects, and yet we keep making the same mistakes. Why? You know, uh, and, and uh, I think that that's ultimately the situation we're in today. Can government take care of it? Man, we've got to get through COPS paradox. It means projects can't be more than two years. It means that leadership, not the IT leader, but the, the secretary, the deputy secretary, the champions, got to be there for that two years. You know, can't decide um, time to take a new job and, and you know, that what happens, uh, I think, with with any of the new initiatives, same thing that I've seen. As soon as that leader moves, the new people come in and, and give the new leader, the, the get uh, hear from the old folks, the 20 reasons why that was a bad idea, <laughs> as you heard, you know. And you're a new appointee and you're thinking, oh my gosh, do I want this risk? Uh, you know, I've got to show I'm doing things different. And boom, the, the things die. And, and so I, I think that's what really makes it hard for the government to adopt these things. By the same token, you know, I look at my pool of LinkedIn folks and continuing innovations I get, it is being used. You know, just like we know that uh, things will be different. Now, what I would say, one of the reasons I, I have a lot more hope for cloud-based technology is because the barrier to entry is so low. In, in the old approach we had to IT, you had to make a capital investment. And you look at Clear Cone and the Paperwork Reduction Act and Fast Unfair and the Given Act and so forth. Those were basically capital investment control processes. In the cloud, you know, you sign up with your home email address, <laughs> you're in, <laughs> you know. And, and so government is trying to figure out, man, how do we enforce our rules over this? You can't. These tools are going to be used, they are being used, they will be used. And, uh, I think the government's got to got to figure out this BYOD BYOS environment. Well, I'd say the positive thing today, if you uh, you know extract from the various comments here, is um, the the technology is more uh, prevalent and is more powerful. There's the pressures to change that are coming uh, because of the, uh, the fiscal. Um, threats, and I think David alluded to this, I'd say it a little more starkly, we, we really have a whole new generation coming into government, and, and fortunately, uh, a, whole new gener a whole generation leaving government. 
that has been in, in many ways an impediment to the to, to uh, that kind of transformative change that I talked about earlier. As as long as though as you have um, bastions in government where you know the Social Security Administration still runs a COBOL Academy. You know, we go out and recruit some of the top college um, students from prestigious universities and then train them in the um, technology that I used all those years ago when I was finishing my dissertation. I mean, I mean, it just, you know, so there, there's, it, it gives me great hope that you have a, a generation coming in that is not only much more comfortable with that technology, but is much more collaborative and open in their decision-making styles. That really, I, I think, uh, that kind of confluence, that kind of perfect storm, uh, gives me hope that uh, this next decade will bring about dramatic change in the way government yeah. does business, interacts with citizens. And, and I think we ought to be talking not also about the way government changes, but if, they, if you use the term governance changes, allows citizens to interact with and affect um, uh, government decision making uh, in, in addition to the issues of doing business uh, on, online. So we, you, you mentioned, uh, Alan, specifically, is, you know, the, the technology and the expertise of the resources that you, know, you mentioned, COBOL specifically. The thing that I see going forward that's very exciting, at least uh, to me, is that um, one of the things that's happening now with, um, because of cloud computing in some ways, but also because of other innovations in terms of the, the models and the way, as Mark mentioned, that you know, efficiency is gained from distributed inputs that are allowing, um, when you get down to it, the infrastructure now is a lot more commoditized and easy to get access to and whatnot. Mo uh, mobile devices and tablets are proliferating out, not just to citizens, but also employees. Um, but the thing that hasn't yet caught up is the middle, which is the applications that are being used and, and delivering the core services. And what I see is the opportunity to tie and kind of glue many of these aspects together is for um, government to be able to tap into new software development, application development methodologies and models such as crowdsourcing, which really don't require the technical expertise to be government employees at all plus can allow the retiring federal employees to tap in on their own time and as, as much time as they want, but still controlling you know, who, through citizenship or security you know, rights and whatnot, can have access to it, and still tap into a whole world of distributed technology expertise that can really change how software is developed for government use. And, then, and by that, I'm talking about taking this, you know, five-year, $50 million kind of uh, IT procurement that we're so used to when it comes to enterprise applications and turning it into still a five-year, but maybe you know, 200 different you know, releases that are, that are really small modular pieces that are developed by much, much smaller teams that are more uh, dispersed. Um, but to do so in a way that is tying into the expertise that the government has and the private sector has and, and kind of mashing it up together at the same time for a whole much more efficient, much more rapid model. Yeah, every, every night when I go on my iPad, I, I see a little button that says you have these uh, upgrades that you've got to do, and you click the thing, and a bunch of my apps get upgraded every day. Like, that seems to be the model, I think, is what you're saying, is that constant uh, upgrading and changing. One, one thing I, I, I worry about a little bit, though, is, is in the private sector, when there are big cost pressures, the company is really facing uh, the wall, uh, they usually have the flexibility to take those pressures and adapt. I, I worry that the federal government, will, will, it, with the cost pressure, won't have the flexibility. It'll just shrink and hunker down and just do less and not do it as well. Because certainly some of these things require a little bit of investment. Uh, the idea if you invest a little bit now, you save big later. And you know, are we thinking about that the right way as, as we move to a much more constrained environment that perhaps we ought to be doing a little bit more right now? with the idea of real accountability and being able to save lots of money later. You know, this is one of the great uh, paradoxes, I think, of, uh, of government's use of IT over the last 30 years. In, from an industry perspective, you always think that technology fosters innovation, but you do have to get over that investment hump to see the benefits, which generally aren't cheaper IT. 
<coughs> you know, there are very few companies that long-term cut the cost of their IT. It's an improvement in worker productivity, and, and, and this is kind of economics 101. You spend a little bit more on capital, then for your labor force, you get higher productivity, right? So, so that's, that ought to be the metric that we're looking at, the total cost of operations, okay? But, you know, there's a challenge in government when you do that. I mean, Doug came into uh, government initially and had a trademark office, and, and you know, that's uh, a, a place that's point, pointed toward now as a real um, uh, place of innovation in terms of the use of telework. But, um, you know, it, there are online search efforts. We never spoke. In, in, in terms of productivity uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, the, because we felt that the Congress would just take, take away the monies and take away them early as opposed to waiting till a little bit later when you can actually demonstrate them. And, and then also some opposition from within, because again, as Doug knows, it's, it's a unionized, very heavily, heavily unionized labor force, and almost all of the labor force there are attorneys. Now, there's, you know, there's something to strike fear in your heart, you know, <laughs> the union of lawyers. Sue you. Sue. So, so I, I, I mean, but, but, you know, I could point to other places in my experience, the weather service too. We, never talked about kind of productivity issues, both because of the pressures from unions and the fear that, not, and it's not just the Congress, because OMB was just as guilty of this too, as, as sweeping in and taking the monies away right in the beginning, whereas Karen <coughs> pointed out, in the beginning, where you're running things in parallel, it's often more expensive initially, and you achieve those savings um, over the longer term, but if you sweep in and take them out at the beginning, you've almost assured yourself of failure in terms of your ability to deliver, meet citizen needs, demonstrate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this could bring in the patent office here. This is slowly going to give turn. me the opportunity to tie back to economy earlier, which was simply about the resources, the efficiency by which you deliver the results of those resources, and then the value that's gained to the business of the mission as a result. Because there is a little bit of light in that example that you use. The only reason why I bring it up is that we were able to in, in no small part, you know, right, coming right on the tail end of the EGOV Act of 2002, was to look at where our opportunity was for, for more efficiency with the resources that we had available to us at that point in time, which was taking a fledgling electronic filing approach and turning it into a completely electronic pipeline and business process. And we were able to do that with a little bit of investment, tying back to your investment hump. But also, we had to tap in, we lowered our, our operations costs 20% in order to lower the hump of investment. And in less than 18 months, we had gone to a completely online process and saved $30 million a year just by eliminating some of the manual processes that were going on. Did that in the end make the results or quality of patents better? Probably not, you know, the end outcome measure. But it certainly made it more efficient, which was what was, you know, kind of the low-hanging fruit at that point in time. And I think paved the way to potentially getting to this, you know, the, the, the better value to um, the overall IP uh, and technology of uh, the overall country here. But back to the investment home point that Mark made earlier, which is, yes, you, you, the good news is that while getting something in return does require an investment, that's why we call it ROI, return on investment, because of the way technology has, has progressed over the last few years, um, there is a much lower cost now to innovate because you don't need to buy the underlying infrastructure. Every project used to have this huge funding bucket for the infrastructure. That's not necessarily required anymore. And then in addition to that, because of the automation features that cloud computing has brought that is built on top of this really highly scaled shared infrastructure, the, the time to value for that, that investment is now really compressed. So if this, if this project was gonna lead to a return that started um, you know, in the old days, you know, four years from now when we implemented the whole thing, you know, now it's being, it's being implemented in a much more compressed fashion to the value to the business, the value to the mission is starting to accrue in three months, four months, five months. So it, my, my point is that, uh, that both of these factors are taking this investment hump and really kind of shaving the top off of it and making it a lower hill to climb in order to get to a better, a better point of delivering, uh, in this case, mission value. <laughs>
So one of the things, I want to uh, build off a point Mark made, which um, is essentially in this new world, the boundaries between an organization and their environment are getting much more porous. And companies, uh, one company like, like um, uh, Procter & Gamble, the whole open innovation movement, and, and government, that's not, when you think of government, you don't think about porous boundaries. Um, how do we get there in 10 years? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the vision, I guess? What's the opportunity for much more uh, of a crowdsourced provision of services or problem solving? Or how do we really tap into the great talents that are? I mean, we have the, I think that, that really cool thing, um, uh, apps for government or whatever that's called. Uh, you know the thing I'm talking about. People, people crowdsource government apps. I'm blanking on the name, but uh, that, that seems like a really cool idea. But it's not obviously not the only one. How do we get to more of that, where people are co-producing, if you will? I, you know, I, I think the one of the things that we've been grappling with as a community is this whole identity management and access control issue, and that's uh, become a huge barrier now to moving off the legacy applications and being able to do this in a way that integrates with your customers. Um, I think Alan mentioned that uh, most of the transactions actually aren't with the citizen at the federal level. Uh, that's starting to change, I think, largely because of demographics, where you do have uh, people, you know, it used to be that the transactions with the citizen were one directional. You gave the government your money, the federal government, and, you, and the number one transaction everybody had it was with the IRS. Okay. So that's now changing where significant portions of the population are receiving the money. And it's largely by uh, the Social Security Administration, the Education Department, and, uh, and the Veterans Affairs Department. Um, so identity uh, either will be agency by agency, we've had it app by app. And, and we have multiple generations. I mean, now I look at the things that we're doing with, with our little startup company. And let me make this just a little bit bigger. You mentioned forms in the last panel. Okay, up until a few months ago when, for whatever reason, GSA decided they want, didn't want to publish how many forms there were. Forms.gov used to tell you there were over 6,000 forms in the federal government. There are over 400,000 data sets. Steve Van Ropel has been clear on saying, let's make those public. So how do you go from 6,000 data collection forms to 400,000 data sets? And I, I can tell you a significant portion in, in my little area. So, so um, incidentally, over the last few years, there have been about five forms that have been consolidated out of those 6,000. <coughs> so uh, uh, my little portion of the world grants uh, is one of those. So it's 5995 now. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and, uh, and, and in the grants arena, you have 23 grant-making agencies, three payment agencies, and then you have the federal subrecipient reporting system for the transparency. So you've got 27 different systems built by 27 different companies. And you go to some common ones like NIH is three quarters of the federal grant research grant. And of course, the system that goes along with that is the payment management system. Now this is a recurring known audit issue. And uh, we've engaged with uh, our representatives in Congress and, and people that we know in the department to try to get this rectified. And the number one issue why they won't come to agreement on a common standard, just XML reporting, is then they would have to agree on identity. Not that they couldn't agree, it's just that that has such a huge ripple effect because there's so many different generations of identity. So I, I think that's step one. And I, I, you know, you we, mean identity meaning an identity management system? Uh, even more basic than that. First thing is just that policy on what is the identity, and, and is it role based? Is it address based or individual based? And I think industry has has struggled with it. There's a number of ways that they've found to resolve it, but it seems to be a much more complicated. So we had e-authentication, we had HSPD-12, we have uh, the, the NSTAC now, uh, and, and none of these seem to have kind of solved this puzzle. You know, with SAML, SAML-2, I don't know how many versions of SAML we're in, but that's number one. You know, we need to, to deal with this issue of identity. 
And once that comes down, then I think we'll see a whole lot more innovation that can occur. Uh, because then we have a basis for um, treating um, either virtualized case management for these issues of veterans with Social Security and healthcare and so forth that all come together. Uh, and just so many walls come down once we get through that infrastructure. And I, and I just want to make a point. I mean, there has been a huge amount of progress made even just over the past a couple of years in federal agencies uh, moving forward to adopt this uh, this, this new technology. I, we have whole. I, I think there are some areas, and there are many of the, the analysts that will say that uh, in parts of cloud computing, actually government is is leading or on par with the private sector. That's a that's a very big deal to say that now to see that we have whole agencies. Even if we sat on this panel, I, I would say 18 months ago, I'm not sure any of us would have predicted that an agency would be um, kind of moving away entirely from a BlackBerry platform and moving its entire agency to the iPhone. I mean, I, even 18 months ago, I'm not sure we could have ever predicted that happening. So so the government is moving forward in, in these areas, proving that it is possible for uh, for the government to adopt these new technologies. And I think that's where the focus really needs to be uh, moving forward, a relentless focus on shortening that, that loop and that lag time between when new technology enters the marketplace to when it's adopted by government. It's going to be adopted by government. And so if we look at we look at the history, right? Um, when the internet came along, when the P, well, well, when the PC came along, when the internet came along, when wireless internet came along, when the BlackBerry came along, all of these technologies, government said at first, no, uh, we can't adopt that. That's not suitable for the government's use. Then maybe we can use it years on, right? And then ultimately they they had a full adoption of all of the, those technologies that I, I just mentioned. So government will adopt this. They can use it. The relentless focus, and, and I'm, this is not an easy problem uh, to solve, but the relentless focus needs to be on how do we shorten that loop so that government can get the benefit of the technology before it's before it's outdated. I mean, it's so many so many of the most terrible program uh, efforts in the. In, in the history of the government that, that, that I know Karen is, is, is familiar with, are, uh, are, are these efforts where so much time was spent and money was invested, <coughs> but it took so long, it took five or six years, and, and, uh, and, and you can't stop the march of time. That technology is outdated by the time it gets to him. So yeah, I want to open up for questions, but I do want to go back to David on one point. I, I was, um, somebody gave me a factoid a while back, which I don't know was true, but it was something that the number of workers per gigabyte of storage at a Google data center is at an order of magnitude less than the number of data center employees the federal government has for the same amount of data. Which gets to the point of that we have to have data center consolidation, which gets to the other point of everybody's going to, you know, every member of Congress with a data center is going to be blocking that. Do, do we need a, a, a national uh, base closure commission, a data center closure commission, where it's an all up or down vote? Or can we get there to some rationalized data center policy with, with something less than that? I'm still working those, those uh, fractions. I, I was told there would be no math on the, on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but sure, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, kind of, the kind of efficiency, I mean, this is, this is what Google is, is focused on. This is our, our, our core business. Is data center. It's, it's what we started. It's what Larry and Sergey did in, in, in the garage, um, and and so we don't expect that the government will will be there, but you know overnight. But certainly that's that's the direction. I think all of industry, that, you know, all, all the the, the, you know, the firms that we're, we're representing here have have um, uh, lessons that that can be learned from the from the government in these areas of, of, of innovation. Uh, but I, I think the, the principal areas are, uh, and if, if, if I could, we, I get asked so many times by uh, representatives in, in government uh, on how, how can we innovate, like what, what we need to know from what Google is doing, whether it be data centers or our overall uh, kind of philosophy or the, the way we manage our, our engineers. What, what do we know? And I, I think there are, there are two tenets. One is relentless focus on the user. Right? That, that's who the technology is for. It is, it is not serving um, just the, the CIO and, and the staff. It is not just about making back-end improvements. It's about changing the way that, that your users work, whether that be the citizenry or your employees. And the other one is, you know, when we talk about, at, at Google, there's this idea that for, for engineers to be successful, they, they need to be um, uncomfortably excited uh, about, about, about what they're doing. And, and, 
I, I do think that there needs to be that in government as well. I think it speaks to what we've all been talking about, the, the challenges to, to break this model, to get out of you know, the, the rut or the path of what is accepted to be done, to take on a, a, a bit more risk, recognizing that the mission of government is so important, and, and move forward with those uh, innovations. But th this is definitely, consolidation is definitely an area where the, the government, while getting out aggressively and, and quite publicly uh, initially, has clearly fallen behind uh, the commercial sector. Uh, and by that I mean is the, you know, the data points that I have and some of the customers that I've worked with is I've seen now in the commercial sector where this best practice is getting beyond this 20-30% virtualized mark, which is a virtualization is just a key component to consolidation. And then those that are getting up to the 70-80-90% mark, their savings are more than double, you know, of, what, of what's happening in that initial phase. And the government is still stuck by GAO's own numbers, you know, recently still in the 25, 27% mark is that they need to get... I just want to explain for folks what 25 and 70 really mean. So that's percent of your overall infrastructure that's utilizing uh, virtualization technology as a means of consolidating, okay? And... Um, it's important because it uses the existing resources more efficiently. Absolutely, and enables you to, to tear out you know, a lot of those existing resources and keep you know, a certain portion of that um, and run more stuff on it, which by definition means more, more efficient. But what I've seen is getting, first, getting up the hump past 25 to 30% and getting into 60, 70% is a, is a challenge for the infrastructure. So that's one thing that, that something different, something more needs to be done. But then what I'm seeing now, CIOs, I saw, I spoke recently with a CIO of a very large global manufacturing IT company, right, makes hardware and software and all this. It's about 40,000 employees globally. When they said, they said they got to this sticking point at about the 40% mark, they went and looked at their application portfolio and rationalized that. They looked at everything. They aggressively said, we need to retire this, we need to combine these, and we're going to upgrade those, and we're going to push all that up that hill to, and they got to the 97% mark, and they saved another, you know, <coughs> it, you know, it's all relative, but they saved, you know, two and a half times what they did in the initial phases. And this is a, is a space where the government has yet to even begin to look at. This is, this is incredibly important. The whole data center consolidation discussion is a red herring if you don't get rid of the complexity of this legacy of hundreds of thousands of redundant applications. It's a red herring. We have so many common services of government being performed by one-off, homegrown applications, and that's what's driving the cost structure. The number of data centers is a cost of quality issue for the federal IT folks. Now, the barrier to consolidation is that all our contracts for IT are essentially labor-based contracts. When you say you're going to consolidate data centers and you do not get rid of labor-based contracts, you inherit the complexity of all these redundant applications. Mark, do you want to say what a labor-based contract is for folks? <coughs> Our contracts are largely time and materials in federal IT. That means we're paying for hours. We're buying hours. We're not buying applications. We're not buying a data center. We're buying people to maintain those applications, run those applications, and run that infrastructure. And the complexity of those applications is driven by the fact that they were uniquely developed. It's just as Alan said, COBOL. You consolidate the data center, and you maintain those COBOL programs. You're maintaining your cost structure, because you still got to buy the people to run those applications. It's exactly as Doug said. When you get to the point where you can consolidate applications and leverage services, then you get to take advantage of cloud computing. And Google started that way. Their original platform was common sets of services, highly virtualized, and scalable. You get huge economies of scale when you do that. The government can't achieve the economies of scale that you would normally associate with data center consolidation because it doesn't want to standardize. It's pretty simple. The, now, you understand this from the appropriator's perspective. You put a program on the books, that program has to be able to sustain, it, sustain itself. So whose job is it to consolidate those applications? Who's going to go to Congress and ask for the funding across, you know, it's exactly as Karen said. <laughs> this is, is the 
you know, binding constraint on the funding side and data center consolidation. It's not that they want to keep the data centers open. It's that they've got to have sustainability within each program. And, and I, I think we're going to make it through figuring that out. Broker concepts and, and other concepts being considered by uh, folks at GSA, folks on the Hill right now. I'm, I'm very hopeful you're going to take us through that. And, and good insights from thought leaders like the folks that, that sitting next to me are, I think, it's real important in that. Well, that's a great, excellent point. Um, yes, sir. Uh, John Mansell, Cable TV Financial Regulatory Analyst. There was some discussion of digital signatures in Estonia and online voting. What are the steps and what are the impediments? And how long will it take for us as a country to get to online voting? Well, I, I can actually be part of that. If you, if you I'm happy to share this study with you, if you go to our website and you put in uh, Understanding International IT Application Leadership, long title. There's seven, six, five reports. One of them is on identity, digital signatures, digital certificates. And one of the proposals we made in there was that the U.S. government, through the State Department, that when any citizen wants to renew their passport for an extra few dollars, they would have the ability to get with their passport a digital certificate. Um, Part of the whole digital certificate or digital signature issue is a chicken or egg issue. Uh, why would I get one because I can't use it anywhere? Why would I have an application to use it when I can't, when no one has one? So the government can play a role uh, in, in kind of getting over that chicken or egg hump. That's essentially what Estonia did. That's what India is doing. That's what a bunch of countries are doing. I see us a long, long way away from that. Uh, eventually this will happen kind of on its own in an incremental way, but it's, uh, I think we're a long, long way away. Let me give you a little anecdote about why I think it, it, in agreement with you, it's, so, it's such a long way away. Is, uh, you know, when I was at the patent office, one of the things we did to enable electronic filing was because of the confidentiality and integrity uh, requirements that we had was a digital certificate approach. And what we found was that while, we, while we, it was challenging enough, we were able to get all of the patent attorneys to go ahead and get their digital certificates. What we found in practice was they delegated that to their administrative assistants because it was too much of a bureaucratic burden for them to actually be, you know, straddled with, you know, actually filing the application myself. So that they were, you know, essentially breaking the trust that, that a digital certificate actually required. Um, and then us, on the other hand, to get our patents electronically, we look the other way and said, that's fine because it's coming from your law firm anyway. You know, so, so the point is, it's just a cultural thing. And then folks don't necessarily want to change. And we're talking about that scale when there were, I don't know, 40,000 practicing patent attorneys in the country. If you're talking about the scale of citizens. Um, that's, that's a significant challenge from a cultural standpoint. Technologically, it's possible, but it still needs, two things need to happen. Standards need to evolve and architectures need to, of the applications need to evolve with it. And it's pretty simple as that. It's very difficult to actually do. It takes a long time. Uh, but until those things happen, it's, it's just not not going to happen. But it's starting to happen from a from an application standpoint. As cloud computing comes into the enterprise, we're seeing it happen uh, certainly on the commercial side. Uh, let me lay out a, uh, a plausible scenario. I can't say that this is the way it's going to happen. Um, I think that uh, the electronic voting <coughs> shift is going to be one of these overnight major election type shifts, not a gradual build up to. And, and I also think that we've missed the, the online web type version of that. You know, in part because the industry hasn't shown that it's reliable and secure. Right? So there is a very rapid emergent in Asia, and I think it will sweep through the country uh, similarly, where your cell phone essentially is the heart of your identity for a number of transactions processing. There will be some experimentations. It will be uh, lots of little elections, and all of a sudden it'll hit a major state or national, and every state will have to have it. And at that point, we'll see the tipping point occur. I, I not that I would disagree with any of my panelists, but um, I do. But, I do think, but I do think one of the differences there is that, is that identity in that form can, can only be given by government, where there's lots of identities that can be given by your banks, etc. Now, one of the things interesting in Sweden, if you look at Sweden, which is actually very far in advance, they deputized their banks. So, so they were sort of in lieu of government. So you, you got a credential that the government would recognize. And I, there may be ways to do that, Mark, but I think that is the key thing to have. Well, to you know, we've seen precedents for that with electronic benefits transfer, where the federal government essentially uses the power of the Federal Reserve and deputizes the banks for citizens. 
My name is Stephen Campbell. I'm a journalist from Denmark, and I would just like to hear in which area you think, when we're back here in 10 years, we'll have made the hugest strides. Will it be education, health? Where will the citizens really feel that government is has changed and has used technology to change? If you go back to um, you know uh, about the time that. Um, um, the Quicksilver Task Forces were working. The uh, then existing, I think, Council for Excellence in Government commissioned a, a poll and, and identified uh, on the part of citizens the, the, their areas of priority in which they would like to to, uh, uh, to see government take action first. Uh, I think actually healthcare was the what was the first one. Um, you know. We certainly have uh, now um, with um, this election, I, I, I agree that we'll move forward in, in this arena. So that, that to me is the likely candidate because it seems to have the confluence of that's where citizens are actually most interested, that's where a lot of work is being done on the privacy trust uh, issue. And there, in fact, uh, government uh, does have funds dedicated to achieve that purpose. So that's where, that's where I would give my vote. You know, one of the things that we <clears throat> haven't hit, we haven't actually used the word big data, although we've been <coughs> talking a little bit about it. I wonder if folks could just talk about that. It seems to me that the big benefit in healthcare is around big data, or certainly <coughs> one, <coughs> one big benefit, the ability to know uh, in much more real time, the disease vectors and treatments and the like. Uh, how how we, in ten years are we going to be there? I mean, we're we're, we're sorts of little bits here and there now, but we're not there there yet. Your thoughts? On it's that? difficult to look through your crystal ball, right? But you know, <laughs> in some ways, you can say, well, we'll never actually get there. But and I think Alan's response was was very consistent with what, what I would expect and, expect. and it's, you know, healthcare is an area where people are going to see the benefits initially because there's so much activity already going on in that area. And in some ways it's because there's a focus on the data aspect. And there's just a ton of effort over many years, not just started two years ago. These, you know, these efforts started a long time ago and are now beginning to culminate in changes in how things occur for various reasons, um, and some of which are legislative. Um, but I would also say that there are things going on in areas that people, citizens, are getting significant benefit from but they will, do not know and may never know, like in the intelligence community, where things are happening already in a very progressive way using these types of technologies um, at, you know, in production today that citizens are getting benefits from, but you know, again, if, if, if all goes well, you never know about it. And so I, my point is, I think it's you know, 10 years from now, there's gonna be benefits gained in almost every area of interaction with government, whether you, you know about it or not, whether it's direct or indirect. But I, I don't, uh, I think there are too many non-market forces operating in healthcare right now for the U.S. to see the benefits um, as much as some of the other areas. So we continue to fall behind Europe, I think, in most studies in terms of the outcomes. And I tend to think of outputs, you know, as being different from outcomes. We're investing a boatload, $7 billion, I think, HHS has for Affordable Care Act implementation. You know, are we going to see anywhere near the commencement improvement in, in uh, delivery services? And, and I just think there are too many non-market forces. I wish that weren't the case. I really do. Because I'd like to see us be the global leader, and I think most people. Yeah, there, there, there are certainly challenges in, in that area. One of them, of course, you know, a couple of them are, are you look at the demographics, you look at the nature of our healthcare delivery system. I mean, you know, um, most of the healthcare in the country is delivered by um, physician medical groups of less than five practitioners. I uh, look at the average age. It's the you know it's it's like the uh, like the SES cadre of government. You know they're they're all middle aged and above, and and uh, so it's like trying to imagine we're going to uh, uh, run the food delivery system in this country by a, 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 a network of kind of corner corner stores. And so so certainly there are challenges and the like. But again, I think in terms of the Confluence of uh, 
where citizens are looking for the need, the investments that have been made there, and the availability of, of, of money, I still think it's, it's an arena that would... I think it's going to be in the three core areas. I agree with Doug. National security, uh, we're already seeing it. They seem to be less encumbered. It's less partisan. Uh, public safety, I think also where you see just tremendous breakthroughs largely again around big data, but, uh, but also driven uh, as much by local government as, as anything very responsive to citizens. And the third we haven't talked about is education. And the reason I, I think education, there's a tremendous amount of untapped <coughs> research insights that made sense when to, to, it made, I shouldn't say made sense, it made it hard for government or the education community to tap into. There's so much going on with technology in virtualized classrooms, getting content open and transparent, and uh, we're seeing basically a tremendous disruption in the way um, higher education is being delivered right now. Uh, it's un the legacy approach is unaffordable. <coughs> Um, there are some institutional things to keep that going, but there's just so much more focus on performance and results, um, uh, investment in R&D, uh, the availability of information, uh, tools that match it together. Ironically, this may be the greatest benefit of NASA, not the Department of Education, and perhaps the Department of Energy as well, is in the education of, of uh, you know, certainly higher ed and, and probably uh, K through 12, or at least uh, 9 through 12. Great. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Dennis McDonald. Uh, I'm an independent consultant. I'm very interested in program transparency and open data and open government. But whatever happens with the fiscal cliff negotiations, government agencies are going to be extremely pressed from a budget standpoint. So I really, in the short term, it seems that having to double run an innovative and an old legacy system can't be afforded. So how, how do we overcome the cost pressure of making things open, making them accessible? It, it isn't free. So I'm really interested in comments about the impacts of, of the realities of cost on making things more accessible and open. Yeah, I think if I could comment on that, I'm, I'm fascinated by the trends we have in front of us. We have the Giver Modernization Act, which should have uh, added to that and facilitated improvements in efficiency. You've got budget pressures, which should dovetail very nicely with Giver Modernization. And yet, when you, you look at the dramatic increase in, in, in IT investments over the last couple of years, and there have been, if you just look at the number of systems, they're largely associated with legacy approaches to creating a future funding stream for a silo within the bureaucracy. And, and uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a great paradox, right? I mean, if you have to have limited funds to invest in, you're, it seems the CFOs certainly aren't supporting investing in shared services, which would maybe cut the cost through economies of scale across the government, but there's no incentive for anyone to invest in it, and there's no incentive for any one appropriation subcommittee to invest in it. Let me tie back to an example real quick before the last part. The example that I used earlier about application rationalization and the benefits that it provides within the scope of an enterprise. In that example, um, this again, this multinational uh, global IT company, um, they started, they were no different than any other IT organization, having a ratio of about 80% of their costs going into maintaining the existing stuff and somewhere around 20% going into some degree of innovation, new applications, add-ons to existing stuff whatever. When they got done, when they got through the, you know, through the infrastructure consolidation, through the application rationalization, and got to this new point, they, they changed to 60% going into keeping the lights on, maintaining, and 40% going into new innovation. So they doubled the amount annually that the company gets to put into new innovative services, capabilities, bringing new things to market. That, and they, they didn't get a bunch of investment money in the process because of what I mentioned, that dynamic of keeping that curve down. They had to continue that evolution. They didn't bump up against the wall and go, oh, I'm done, throw their hands up and say, I don't have any more money for innovation, so I'm stuck here at 20%. They were able to continue to self-fund through the savings they were getting from the initial phase. I, I've run projects like that where I'm you sorry, killed we, off projects. 
we, we need to stop, and I encourage you to have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promised people we would adjourn. So I want to do two things, but don't get up until I do both of them. First of all, I want to thank this great panel and our first panel.